amen, and amen. Well, how are we this morning? They asked for a fun facts, and so I, I put up one of my favorite quotes. It was, a, it was a close race. It was between that quote and my favorite movie, which is Die Hard. I love Christmas films, and so for me, Die Hard is the best Christmas film of all time. And so that was going to be it, but then I was like, I just put an inspirational quote or something. Um, and I know some people don't think it's a Christmas film by any means. We can disagree on that. But one of us is wrong, and uh, one of us is about to get to, ready to talk about Be Strong. So you guys figure it out. Make it happen. No, I, I'm so excited. The, the, if I could just speak on behalf of the Armory uh, leadership team, we are so excited for today. We've had the last three to four months to be sitting on this theme of what it means to be uh, strong. And so I've been tasked by the team to just kind of share a little bit about our heart for uh, really the Armory conferences as we gather together like this each year. Uh, and then also talk about our format for today um, a little bit. And then I want to kind of just talk uh, a little bit about this theme. Because one of the things that we, we said as a team uh, is that, you know, you guys are coming in at a bit of a disadvantage. We've had three or four months to just talk through this idea of what it means to be strong. And you guys are just kind of hearing it for the first time. Maybe you saw a couple ads on Facebook, but we need to unpack that so we're all on the same page there. But I'd love to just start. Tom mentioned this in the beginning. One of the things that has just been on, the, on our heart and at the forefront of our minds as we prepare for today's like today and we, and we work on sessions like the ones that we've prepared, one of the things that we want to do just lay out right at the front gate of, of this morning is this, is that we are not here to put more pressure on you. Like here's what I know to be true, including for myself, including for the men that will be standing up on this platform. There are pressures on our lives right now. Whether it's in our career or in our family life or in our marriage, there are pressures that we have. And, and, and here's, what, here's what I just, I, I know, perhaps you're familiar with other men's conferences. And, and uh, maybe you, my, my wife, she actually is a part of our, our women's conference here. And this is what I know about the differences between women's conferences and men's conferences. Women's conferences have no problem uh, when it comes to affirmation. It's just the truth. It is, it is, girl, you've got this. You're amazing. Well done. You're a warrior princess mama. Jesus loves you. And it is, it, is, it is amazing. And I'm not even knocking that. I'm saying that is a good and right thing. But what can tend to happen in conferences like this, in a zeal for, let's be, let's be blunt. Let's talk like men. Let's be aggressive. And I, I love that. And there's going to be some aggression here this morning. But we're not going to lose ourselves and derail by saying, hey, you're an idiot. Here's five points I have of why you're a moron. That is not what we are going to be accomplishing today because that is not what the word of God says. We will speak with confidence about what the scriptures say, not in our zeal for being, let's talk like men and let's shoot straight from the hip and let's do that. I want to do all those things, but we will do it in an honoring way that brings life, that you would be refreshed and that it would be a breath of fresh air. And so that is why Tom said it this morning, today is going to be a call to step in, not to step up. And, and, and so if I could just break that down, what we mean by a call to, to stepping in and not to stepping up is that what can happen is we go, okay, here's the ideal man. Here's what an awesome husband would be like, and here's what an awesome father would be like, and this is what a man in the community would look like, and then there's you. And see how you, you see what's happening here? So here's, here's five books that you should be reading, and here's something that you should be doing better in, and here's what you should be doing when you get home. And if we're not careful, what we do is we create this standard, this ideal man that is unreachable. And then we say, well... Be strong. Good luck. We'll see you next year. And we come in with more weight than when we walked in, and that is not what today is going to be about. It's not stepping up to an ideal, but rather stepping into the call of God and the purposes of God for our lives as men. And, and what that looks like, what should be felt as we unpack today, as we, as we talk through what the scriptures say of what, what it means to be strong in today's culture and in today's generation, as we talk through that, you should be feeling weights lifted off of you. It should feel like you're putting on a suit that was tailored for you. Not this awkward, clunky thing where it's frustrating. I don't really fit this model. This isn't the kind of dad that I am. This isn't the kind of father that I am. But rather, as you step into it, it's like wearing a second set of skin that just is right for you. That you are uniquely and wonderfully and fearfully made by God. And that when he calls you out into his purposes and you step into it, it feels the most natural way that you've ever felt before. It is not awkward. It is not frustrating. And honestly, if you're feeling frustrations and awkwardness, what we want to do is we want to take some of that pressure off because you're probably living in a way that is not what God had designed for you. That you're trying to stretch yourself and be something that you're not. And God's saying, I made you for you. I made you for such a time as this. I gave you the family that you're called to be, and I've given you the wife that you're called to lead and to love, and it's going to be something with ease and of comfort and of joy. doesn't mean it's not always going to be hard, but it will be soul-satisfying. That is how men should live. And so that's a, a, the heartbeat that we just want to say is we are not here to put more weight on 
but to take weights off and for a call to not step up to some ideal that can never be hit, but rather stepping into the call of God for our lives. And so that's the first thing. Now, on a practical note, you, you probably received a journal or a notebook, or maybe you've got your own note, notebook and you want to take some notes today. What we would ask is if at the very beginning of that notebook, on, on the first page or the first couple pages, if you would just uh, put, put some numbers up on the side, go one, two, three, four, and five, just break it down like that. And, and what we want to do is we, we're going to have uh, a time of teaching. I'm going to jump into session one in just a moment. And what we'll do is after each session, we'll have a time of practical application where we'll work on things and we'll, we'll talk. Some of it will be very personal, so you'll be able to do some work with just you and the Lord. And then we set up tables like this because there are going to be moments of collaboration and just talking it through as men. Ironing, iron sharpening iron, if you will. And, but what we want to do with this, the reason we have this is as we got to talking about our sessions, one of the things that each guy on the team wanted to do is we said we wanted to make it as simple as possible, but we wanted to lay out right at the front gate of each session a takeaway statement. And so what we mean by that is we want to say if you don't hear anything else, if you don't hear the, the different analogies or stories or jokes and you don't know what our point is and, and you know this is going to happen, you're going to get home and your wife's going to say, how was the conference? What was it about? What did Tyler say? What did Greg say? This is your cheat sheet right here. This is going to summarize every session, one through five. I'm going to have a takeaway statement. I'm going to say, this is all I want you to know. This is the thing. As I've been studying the scriptures, this is the thing that the Lord has been put on my heart that is, I'm running with because I absolutely love it. That is what we want you to write there. So it's a takeaway statement. So as we get into the session, that's what we'll write. And I'll let you know when that phrase comes up. Sound good? All right, let's get into it. So session one, I've been tasked with be strong in vision. And so what we're going to do is we're going to be diving in. Session two is going to be with Russell. He's going to be talking about identity. Uh, Ryan will be talking about community. Joe will be talking about family. And uh, Greg will finish up the day talking about being strong in our marriage. We want to hit on all these different aspects of our life where God has called us to lead and to step forward and to be strong. And in this first session, I really want to cast a vision for the day, but really kind of make a foundational theme. Because, again, catching everybody up who wasn't in those initial meetings when we were planning today... Really, this is going to be a foundational talk where all the other talks can kind of sit their hats on as we build off of one another. And so, so this is what uh, today is going to be about, this morning will be about. It'll be about not just vision casting for what we mean by be strong, but I want to talk about the God-given vision that he has for your life. My talk is about God's design for man and our role as men, or our role as men, other, otherwise how we use our strengths. And here's my takeaway statement for you. This is what I want you to write down. Anything else that you hear, just this is the thing that I want you to know. And, and it's, it's crucial. I, I, I'm so invested in this statement. Do not trade eternal promises for weak and temporary comforts. Do not trade eternal promises from God in heaven for weak and temporary comforts of the world. God has things for us. I mean, you and I, we were made of eternity substance. That you were made in the image and likeness of God. Your soul was made for eternity and your soul will only be satisfied with eternal matters. And so I'm not saying that everything that we see in the world is evil or wrong or sinful by any means. But what I am saying is if you go there to find rest, you won't find rest. You might find comfort that is numbing, but you will not find a soul satisfaction that you were designed for by God. And so we want to do some work on how do we find these eternal promises that are scattered throughout our life, and that's what we're going to be diving into. Now, now here's what I know. Oh, let me start, let me start here. So that's the phrase. Here's the text. I'm going, to, I'm going to say this text right up front, and then we're going to catch it at the end, because uh, it's a weighty text. Paul says a lot of strong language, but if we don't do a little bit of work before we get to breaking it down, we're all going to be hearing different aspects of it and not really being all on the same page. And so, so here's the text, 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 13 and 14. Listen to this. It says this. Be watchful, stand firm in the faith. I love this statement. Act like men. Be strong. There's our theme. Let all, let all, everything that you do be done in love. All of that is so definitive, so aggressive, so strong. And, and, and so what I want to do before we get to breaking that, t that text down, I want to just to make note of something, and that is this. That if we look around this room right now, there are, are young men, 17, 18 years old. There are older men, 60, 70 plus. We all have different backgrounds. We, we grew up in different parts of the country, perhaps, or different parts of the world. We had different father figures in our lives, or even some might not have father figures in our lives, or we had men in our community that helped kind of raise us and show us the way. We all have different experiences and backgrounds. 
And so, so when we read a verse like that, it says, hey, act like a man. Be strong. Some of us here in the back of our mind are hearing our dad and not in a great tone say, hey, man, act like a man. Don't be a sissy. That's not how a man would act. Act like a man. Some of us are be strong. The, the, the young man who's 17, when he hears be strong, is hearing something incredibly different from the 70-plus-year-old man who hears be strong. We're all hearing the same words but hearing very different things, Right? And so in order for us to, to, to get all on the same page, I want I to do a little work when it comes to definition and defining what does it mean to be strong. And so, so here's, here's what I want to do. No, no pulling punches by, by any means at all. But uh, I'm going to talk about biblical definition of strength. So that's where I'm going. But we have to do a little bit of work because, because why should we follow the scripture or the biblical definition of strength? Why is that the definition for our lives? And, he, and here's some more that I know about us without, without knowing every single person in the room. I know this about men. I've yet to meet the man who is not like this. We want our lives to matter. We have ambition and it's from God. We want our life to count. We want to know that when we spend out our days, we can look back and say, there was something worthwhile there. It wasn't a waste of my time. It wasn't a waste of other people's time that I built something that is going to last. I built something that has legacy behind it. I built something that matters, that has substance to it. That is, that is what I know to be true about each one of us. Something in us says, I want today to count. I want tomorrow to be something of, of real substance. And so this is why definition is so important. This is why I want to talk about uh, the biblical definition of strength and why definition is so important and really the, the power and importance of definition because this is the thing about definitions. Definitions... They are like the guardrails of your life. They are like the, the rules of operation. In a sense, they are like the blueprint for building the life that you want to build. Think about it this way. If, if, I am, if I am a husband, the way that I define a husband determines the way that I behave and the way that I act. The way that I would define uh, the role of a wife would determine how I treat her and what I expect from her. The way I define marriage is going to determine the way that I, I live that out on a regular basis. And that begins to shape the life that I'm building. If I see friendship as, about, as, as just networking, it has nothing to do with love or relationship. It's all about transaction and what can you give for me and I can give to you and we'll build some sort of kind of business alliance together and we can share our resources. If that's all that it is. Well, then the decisions that I make and, the, and the, the choices that I make in regards to you and me is all about what can I get from you. And so the definitions of our life, they will determine the way in which we build our life. And if we're trying to build something of substance and something that will last, the definitions that we go by, they matter. Definitions, they will determine the strength of the life that you and I are building. Definitions will determine the strength of the life you and I are building. So, so let's talk for a moment. Before we get to biblical definition, there's other places where we can find Definition. So there's three areas that I want to talk about before we get to biblical strength and get back to that text in 1 Corinthians. Uh, the first place that we could find definition is, is you and I could be our own definition. Like we could define our lives. I can say, well, it's my life. I know how to build it. I should be able to make the decisions. Why should someone else tell me how to live my life? Why should I be submitting to a purpose from God? He gave me this life. Am I not supposed to make the decisions? Shouldn't I be, in a sense, my own boss? And, and here's, here's the trouble that I just want to lay before you and why that would be a problem. If perhaps that's you, you're saying, yeah, there's some things that I'm like, you know what, these are the things that I'll, I'll, I'll do, and that's kind of in the church and in the scriptures. But there's these areas that I'm like, you know what, I don't know if God really cares how I handle these matters. I'm going to take care of these. I got it, God. And here, here's the problem with that. If I look back at my life, and I, I, I'm just now approaching 30, so it's not like it's been a crazy long life, but if I just look at my life as, as Tyler at 18 years old, or I look at my life, Tyler, at 15 or 12 years old, and I go to 12-year-old Tyler and I say, all right, God, go ahead and define life. That's going to be a weird life, guys, I'm going to tell you right now. And if I move forward and I say, okay, what does 18-year-old Tyler think about life and how she define it? One, he thought that he knew everything. I was in college and I was like, man, I, I see straight. I got it. Couldn't tell me anything. Thank God that that guy's not the guy who's defining my life. And you know what I know to, to be true? And I'm not, even, I'm not even there yet. I know that 50-year-old Tyler is going to look back on 30-year-old Tyler and in some ways there'll be an eye roll and man, there was some silly naivete there. And I, and I even see some smiles in the room. I know that there's going to be a 70-year-old Tyler who looks at 50-year-old Tyler and he's like, man, I'm glad we're growing. 
Here, here's the crazy thing, and I, I just I know it to be true because I don't care. The, the man that I met, the oldest man that I met, has always said this: "I've yet to arrive. I haven't gotten there yet." We are constantly growing in experience and knowledge, and that is a right and good thing. But what does it tell you? It means that we are prone to change. And why is that a big deal? If you are the definition of your life, if you are the one who's making the decisions of how your life should be and how you should operate as a husband, as a father in the community, if that is up to you, what's going to happen is you're going to build your life, build your life, build your life until you go, oh, wait, I think it might look better over there. The lighting looks a little bit better. And again, this might be me being naive because I'm not, I'm not there yet, but if my, if my suspicions are right, I think this is where midlife crisis comes from. Men in their 40s and 50s, and they say, man, I just thought my life would be farther along by now. I thought, I thought that I would have it more together. I'm not sure what I'm building here, but it's not something that's satisfying me like it once did. I used to be happy, and now I'm not liking it anymore. And so we try and build our life somewhere else. If we're trying to build something that lasts and as of substance, we can't be building something that is so prone to change. And if we are the definers of our lives, that is exactly what will happen. The second area where we can't find definition is, is in culture. Culture, if we, if we find definition there, there's a ton of problems with that. Very similar to if you're the definer, let's just look back in history. What it meant to be a man in the 1920s and 30s and what it meant to be a man in the 1950s and 60s and what it means to be a man today are two or three very different pictures, right? I, and I don't know if you've seen the show uh, Mad Men. I wouldn't honestly recommend it because I watched two or three episodes and I was just like, this is just crazy. Uh, it's, a, it's following a, a marketing firm uh, and these guys just doing business and it's all shysty. And, and the, the thing about that show is the way in which they treat women in the office, the way in which they talk about their wives. It's just second rate citizens, kind of like a second family pet. And that's, that is the view of women. Now here's what I want to say. The show is fictional, but that depiction of that time and era, accurate. And we look back and we say, oh man, that's so backwards. That, who would ever think like that? And yet... Back then, society would say, this is right and good. This is how men should be. And I guarantee you, in 1950s, 1960s, men in that time looked at 1930s, 1940s, and said, man, they're so backwards. They don't really get it. So what does that mean? I guarantee you, you can go ahead and take my word to the bank, 2030, 2040. They're going to look at men in society today, and they're going to go, man, what was that? And so the point, again, that I'm trying to make, I'm, I'm belaboring a little bit, but the point that I'm trying to make, because it matters, this is how we are going to build our lives, is that if we let culture and society, meaning the majority votes, whatever seems to be kind of, what is, what is the general consensus of how a man should be, what it means to be a husband or a father, what's the general consensus, what's the popular vote, if that is how we determine how we ought to build our life, we are going to be building towards a standard, and then one day we're going to find out actually the standard's behind you. So what do we got to do? We got to abandon what we've built, and we got to start building again over here. As the opener said, it's just a constant moving target. Always telling you that there's more, always promising you to deliver something, but never quite arriving. And then the third area, and this is one that I think is probably one of the biggest threats to us, and it's something that we've, we've got to shake off in some ways. We've got to let the Holy Spirit do a work, and that is our past and our upbringing can define us. When it comes to our past, how, how many of us can say, yeah, there's some baggage that I'm carrying and, and some of us, look, I, I came from an incredibly whole home. I had an incredibly great father figure in my life. And so perhaps you're here and you didn't have a father figure or, or it wasn't a great one at all. What I'm saying is that whether it was non-existent or whether it was phenomenal, what I can say about parents, what I can say about fathers, good men even, that as little boys you look at your dad and there's just this Superman logo on his chest at all times. How could I fill that man's shoes? And as you grow and as you get older and as you do life, you begin to see how your dad bleeds like every other man. And the logo begins to fade. And all I'm simply saying, it doesn't mean that he's doing anything wrong. And it doesn't mean that we shouldn't take some things from our past and use them. It just simply means that it's imperfect. There's fallible. Human beings will make mistakes. And so if we only use our past to define our future, we are going to constantly be having to pull some stuff down and rearrange it and change. So it's like, where do we get a clear definition? And that's why I want to talk about what is biblical strength? Because God is not like a man that he should lie or change his mind. His definition of masculinity and manhood and strength is the very same as we read in Genesis as it is today, and it hasn't changed. 
and, and he's not like culture and society where he is like a sifting or a sifting and sinking sand. He declares himself to be the rock of ages. You can build a life on a firm foundation. And he's not like earthly fathers that will make mistakes and they're not perfect. He is a good and perfect father who can be trusted. The words that he speaks over you, you can take it to the bank. So if we're going to build our lives, if, we're, if we want to have a life that is monumental, that has substance, that is about legacy, that as men, a part of the job that we're supposed to do is to take something from a previous generation that is good and godly and run with it and take it as far as we can and hand it off to our sons and say, go boy. That is a part of the role of men of God. But if we're going to do that, we have got to make sure that what we are building will last and not be burned away when this world passes. It's, a, it's something that we wrestle with, that, that, it, that we have to deal with, but our life is a vapor, and our name will be forgotten. But the decisions and the actions that we make today, they will be like a residue that can sit on our children and our children's children's life, that they might build something and take it farther than we did. And that is what we are doing today. There is so much at stake for what it means to be strong as a man. Get back on my notes. So we're going to get down to that text. I just I want to belabor this just slightly a little bit more because I want to point out we, the, the, the goal for me is I go, okay, I want to go God's design for man, but I, I want to just show the danger and why we have to completely reject the framework of the world. Because what, what happens is, is, is we see this pendulum swinging throughout history of, you know, like what it was in the 1950s, 1960s. These guys were these domineering jerks. And so don't show any masculinity because I don't want to be like this guy. And that's what society is. Don't be like this guy over here. And so then you swing the pendulum over to be Mr. Nice Guy. Even though the saying is nice guys finish last. Like, yeah, be that guy. We'd rather you be a doormat than, than abusive. And I'm like, yeah, I don't want to be abusive, but I also don't want to be a doormat. That's not strong either. And, and here's the crazy lie, is that we'll believe that, okay, let's meet somewhere in the middle. So we're going to swing back and forth until we can arrive somewhere in the middle. So our, our life is stalled as men. That's the best that we can hope for. We were not made like monkeys to swing back and forth, gentlemen. We were made in the image of God. I'm saying take the pendulum, the framework out completely and throw it away. What does God say about men? Our life is to be active, not swinging back and forth, but moving forward. And so here's what I, I want to say. I, I understand the temptation of why we would want to define our own lives or why we would let culture and society or why we let our past, our baggage, kind of run with us and why we allow those things to define elements of our home and of our life. Because when we, when we look at why, why would we want to be the definition of our life, because it's easy. Think about it. You're your own boss. You answer to no one. Yeah, am I going to have to deal with the consequences of my mistakes? Absolutely. But you know what? We, we lie to ourselves. We say, well, I'm not going to make the mistakes of my old man. I, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to repeat history. And the crazy thing is, as Solomon would tell us in Ecclesiastes, you will. You'll repeat mistakes. But we do it because we tell ourselves, this is an easy way. I will make my own answers. And in, in a sense, we might not say it this way, but I will be my own God. The, the second Thing, the reason that we do this and the reason we would follow culture and why we let culture define us is because it's popular. And some people might laugh, but, but to be a man in today's society is not easy. Some might laugh and say, well, you guys are making all the rules, you're making more money, all this kind of stuff, and we can argue that later on. What I will say, it is not easy because we are being called uh, intolerant, we are bigots, we are homophobic, we are, I mean, God forbid we're intolerant or we're hypocrites or we hear anything like that or we're, we're against the flow. And so it's not easy because every turn we make, anytime we try and show masculinity, anytime we try and show any strength, we're slapped on the hand. Don't do that. And so it's popular. We want to be celebrated. We don't want to be rejected constantly. We don't want to be rebuked every single day. So it's just easier instead of, it's the path of least resistance. Why go there when I don't have to? And this is why husbands check out. I'm not going to have that argument again. I don't know, honey. You decide. I don't care anymore. It's the popular thing. There's, there is a allure to doing that. And why do we let our past define us? Because it's familiar. It's familiar. It's what we know. 
We use that excuse of, I don't, I don't know how to be anything else. This is what I saw growing up. I don't know how to do anything differently. This is just how it was in my home, and I'm not sure what, what the answer is. And so we, we'll go to that because it's familiar for us. And what it does is it's easy, it's popular, and it's familiar. And what we've done is we've created for ourselves a comfort zone. And we think there's safety in this. I can build here. At least I have some options of how I can build my life. There's this um, statement from a pastor named Levi Lusco. He's a pastor in Montana. And he said this about comfort zone. And it's just, it just kind of shook me to the core. He said, you know, the tricky thing about comfort zones is we tell ourselves that they keep us safe. But comfort zones, they don't keep us safe. They keep us small. I want my life to matter. I want there to be legacy. I want to look back on my deathbed and say, man, I left it all on the field. And you can have comfort zone and you can be the one who decides how your life should be lived and you can let culture kind of do its thing and just kind of float through life. But it's going to be a life that is, has a ceiling on it. And it's going to be small. And I'm telling you, that is not what God has for you and it's not what he has for me. You were made up of things of eternity. God has a vision for your life, men a profound vision. You and I were made as citizens of heaven. We were made for a city whose architect and maker is God. And we have to keep at the forefront of our mind a vision of that, that we would make decisions not on what is comfortable for us, not on what is easy for us, but, but to go after what is good and right and of eternal substance because at the end of our day, will we be tired perhaps, but tired is not bad. There's an, there is a tired that is not soul crushing or soul depleting. It is satisfying to look back on your work and say, man, that was a good day. And I'm telling you, it is not a call to step up. It is not something that you have to strive for. It's just simply an invitation every single day to say, God, God is with you and he is with you in the battle. And he is saying, I've prepared for such a time as this for you and me to go into battle together. Would you step in with me, son? It's not about your effort. It's not about your work. It's not about your intelligence. It's making a decision today and saying, God, I'm with you. And I know that you're with me. Let's fight. So, so I, I try my best when, I, when we want to talk, let's talk about b- biblical definition of strength. And again, we're going to get to that text. I, I wanted to, instead of just saying, hey, okay, here's a statement of what biblical strength is, because that for me was, I mean, it's just hard. But let's talk description for a moment. Let's talk day-to-day life, Monday to Friday. You're saying, Tyler, I, I get it. I want to step into the internal promises of God. And I don't want to, I don't want to uh, just, just do the easy route of taking on comforts that are temporary and that aren't going to satisfy the soul. But how, what does that look like practically? And the, and the nice thing is, as we talk about the vision that God has for your life, I've got men who are going to come up behind me, and they're going to talk about identity, what that vision looks like, what is your, God's vision for marriage, what's your, the vision for family, what's the vision for community. And so they're going to go into a lot more detail than I am. But if I could just hit on some points. Uh, I, I have a daughter named Evangeline, and she is just breathtaking my world. I mean, it is just something else to be able to stare at another little human being who, who looks like you and acts like you in some ways and acts like her mom in some ways. And uh, while I love her to death, after working eight or nine hours and I come into the house, I'm exhausted. And and what would be the most comfortable thing for me in that moment was, you know, kiss Nicole. Hey, how's your day? I'm really not looking for a lot of details because I'm just tired. I'm just being honest. I'm tired. Nicole, Evangeline's playing with blocks on the floor. And I, you know, I'm like, great. I'll I'll just, I want to sit on the couch. I want to get a a beer or coffee or something and just check out for a moment watch some Netflix or watch a game or just something where I don't have to think about what just happened at work and, and I want to be there. It's just, it's just a comfort zone for me. Not a sin, if I can be honest. We need to have moments to where we can just check out for a moment, just to breathe. I'm not, I'm not saying it's wrong. But what I am saying is the lie is that Netflix and having a beer and watching the game is going to give you rest. It's not. I heard it said from a, a friend of ours, Peter Rasmussen, he says, man, Netflix isn't going to give you rest. It's going to make you numb. And that's what, I mean, at the end of the day, that's what it does. You're still going to go to bed reeling with stuff in your head. It's not going to feel like you rested because, because we're looking for rest in something that is temporary and it's weak. It will not hold the test of time and your soul was built for eternity. So you're trying to feed an eternal soul with something so temporary and weak like Netflix. It's not going to happen. And so, so where's the eternal promises? Well, he, well here's what happens. As, as a parent, just because we clock out at 530 doesn't mean the job's done. 
You're saying, Tyler, where's the eternal promise in your life? You know what it is? It's sometimes it's getting on the ground and playing blocks with Evangeline. And she doesn't even play blocks right. She builds a tower and she's like, check this out. I'm like, that's amazing, baby. I'm like, I'm gonna build one. She's like, no, you're not. Boom, knocks it down. I'm like, I'm trying to build my life here. She's like, nope, and just knocks it over. Frustrated. And, and so I'm, I'm tired. I don't wanna be on the ground. I was joking with some of the, we were joking with some of the guys, like as you get older, like even like sitting on the ground hurts. What are you doing? I'm just sitting here on the ground. What's happening? I can't do it anymore. It's too- and Joe's going to talk about this today, and it's so profound what he, what he has stirred up, this, this idea that when you sit on the ground with your kids and you're playing with them, there's these moments, not every time, but there's these moments where God opens up a picture of what eternity is like, that he shows you flesh and blood right in front of you, a depiction of what, what it's like to be a father and a child. And he's like, man, that's who I am for you. And he opens up a window to speak into your child's soul and to cultivate that soul. And that's where eternal promise is made. And so when I'm exhausted, because now I've worked 10 to 11 hours, I'm bathing her and putting her to bed and Nicole's making dinner and we're just trying to get through the day and get her to sleep. So now I'm exhausted. But I tell you what, when I go to bed exhausted, it's not soul crushing. I'm ready to fight another day because I, I have something in me that was satisfied. The same can be said about a husband and wife. There's moments where Nicole's like, how was your day? And I'm like, it was good. And she's, she's digging because, it, because that's, she knows me. She's like, hey, I, I, you need, let's, let's talk. Let's have a moment to really connect. And again, what's the comfortable thing? I don't want to connect. I just want to check out for a moment. I'm, I'm tired. And yet the Lord gave us wives, not just because marriage is awesome and it's incredible, because he wanted to show us a picture of something eternal. That your wife is a physical representation of what it means to have unmerited favor, to have unconditional love, to have grace. Is it always like that? Is it always fun? No, but there are these moments, these pockets of times where the heavens open and there's these eternal truths that come out. And you're like, I see God more clearly because of my wife. I know the design that God has for me in my role because my wife has led me to a space where we are having a moment and I see things of eternity. See, sometimes we we want God to invade the issues of our life and to fix us. Lord, Lord, take the things of you and and to fix our lives. And Lord is going to sometimes take the issues of our lives and show us the things of God. And we have opportunities throughout our life to touch eternity, gentlemen. When it comes to community, Ryan's going to dive into that. But we we joke about this often. There's sometimes the last thing I want to do is get into the car, drive 20 minutes away to somebody's house, have have a bunch of conversation, pay a babysitter 25 bucks, and then and then have an evening where we're just talking and, and engage. And I'm like, I've been doing this all day. I'm, I want to just check out. And here's what I can tell you: I have never left a community group and said I regretted that. So I mean, I, I can't even count the times that I haven't said it. That I'll walk out, I'll look in the corners, man, I needed that. I needed that. After the day that I just had, I needed men and women around me to encourage me in the things of God, to encourage me and know that it's gonna be okay, that we're gonna fight together, that I'm not alone. I need that. And Russell's gonna talk about more and more about identity and about our souls and and, and God's vision for our lives as sons and as warriors in the kingdom. And so I'm gonna let him uh, take it from there in just a moment. But let's get to that text. So, he, so here's the thing um, about the, the text that's, that's going to come up and, and what I want to say, that all of those things that I was talking about, for you to sit on the couch and to watch sports, none of it is evil. It's not wrong and it's not sinful. But our life is made up of definitions that we build with, but, but the decisions that we make are what's going to really shape our life. And gentlemen, we can have comfort or we can have his promises, but we can't have both. And so you're going to have to make decisions. And it's not about effort. I'll, I'll, like... Like this isn't a striving thing of, hey, step up and do better. You know, you need to, you need to work a little bit harder. This is like, we're going to play some blocks. You can do this. We can do this. The Lord is going to be with us and he's going to restore our souls. And we'll get there in just a moment of, of how that works, how he meets us when, when we're tired. But, but this, this scripture, 1 Corinthians, uh, Paul's writing to the church in Corinth. And the entire book of 1 Corinthians, he, he is literally just re- like, pointing out, this is God's design and this is what you guys are doing that's not right, but you're doing this well, but, but stay here, be, be here, stand in this thing. So he talks about what it means to be a, a, a single, what it means to be married. Uh, he talks about sexual immorality and how that is not the way of God, that is not how God would define your life. So he talks about all these little details 
And then he comes to this verse after he says, hey, this is what a mature man, this is what a, a mature person looks like in the kingdom of heaven. This is how we are called to operate. This is how God designed you to live and to be satisfied. And so then he ends it with this statement. He says, in light of everything that I've just shared, this is God's design for you. This is how you should live. This is how you should operate. This is the role of man. He says this. He goes back to the text and he says, be watchful. Be watchful. Where do you have definitions that are not right? This is where manly aggression comes in. This is where strength comes in and say, you know what? I will not let that definition stay in my house. Because that is not how a wife is to be defined. That is not how a husband should be defined. That is not how a daughter should be defined. That will kill us. We will not, we, we cannot flirt with definitions that are not from God. Like, I don't have time to preach this, but if I could be honest, if I, if I said, Tyler, where's the idols in your life? They're somewhere in the comfort zones. They're not like, my, my temptations and the idols of my life are not like, you know, I'm gonna go murder somebody or I'm gonna knock over a liquor store or something like that. It's all of the small things that I don't think are that big of a deal that I tell myself, it doesn't really matter. They fit somewhere in that comfort zone. And that's, that's where they hide. And I'm telling you, gentlemen, here's where aggression comes in. You do not flirt with definitions that are not from God. You take them kicking and screaming out of your home. You drag them into the street and you shoot them in the face. We do not flirt with those things. Was that too much? If that was too much, that got real, that got real aggressive. I'm gonna go uh, do some heavy rope. I'm gonna just wear, I'm gonna, there was a little bit more mustard on that than I wanted, but you get the point. You get the point. Be watchful. Stand firm in what we know. Don't be confident in your own strengths. What we are saying when it says be strong, be confident in the strength that is God breathed, that is Holy Spirit infused. Stand firm in this truth that you know. I will not back down from these definitions because these definitions will bring life and freedom for my family. And I stand in the gap for that. That is what is at stake. And then it says, act like men. I love that the translation is, is play the man. Play the man. God says, hey, this is how I've designed man to be. Play like that. Play the man. Be mature is what it's saying. We are building something that's last. So if we're going to build something that will stand the test of time, we have to play the man. And then our theme here, be strong. And this is what we want to just convey throughout every, every session uh, the tech, there'll be several different texts about what it means to be strong. There's so many commands in the scripture from God about being strong. When, when uh, uh, God spoke to Joshua, hey, Joshua, stand firm. Be of good courage. Be strong and very courageous. That, that translation is not, hey, Joshua, I need you to man up. I need you to pull yourself up by the bootstrap. This is what a strong man would do. This is what a brave man would do. Now live up to that. Come on, I need you to get courageous for me, Joshua, and go fight a battle. What it's saying is it's not a call to pull yourself up by your bootstraps. It is not saying, hey, you need to be strong. God is saying, Joshua, you, you were made in my image. Take some of this, be strong. That God looks at the entire scope of our lives. He is perfect in all things and all knowledge. And he looks at where we are today in our last day here on earth. In every single moment, in every single battle that he calls us to, when we are tired and exhausted, he's there and says, hey, guess what? I know you were gonna be here. And so I brought you rest I brought you encouragement. I brought you strength to fight the next battle. And not only that, but you and I are going to war. It's not just you. To be strong is not saying I've got to have some self-effort and pull myself up by the bootstraps. It is me saying, God, I am stepping into the purposes that you have called me to. And those purposes, there you will meet me. And we're going to fight. And that's what it means to be strong. And in this last statement, man, let all that you do be done in love. Love, it is the engine room. It is the thing that motivates us. It is the thing that compels our families to follow us as we chase after the God-given vision from heaven. Why do I do what I do? I, I make decisions on not my preferences and what would make me comfortable because those things are weak and they are temporary and they do not satisfy my soul. I make decisions for my life based off of the way God would define them for me because I love my wife and she needs me and I need her. And I love my daughter and I love men like you and we're gonna fight together. Everything that we do is because there is something at stake worth fighting for. I've heard it said, there's two men you don't mess with, a man who has nothing to lose and a man who has everything to lose. Guys, we were built for eternity. We have so much at stake and yet God is saying, I'm with you. You're not gonna lose it. You can do this. 
So be strong. Let's pray together. Holy Spirit, I can, I can feel you in this place right now. There is, we can feel this in our bones and in our DNA that we were made as things of eternity. That you have built us to be strong for, for our lives and for our families, for, for our communities and our cities. That you've called us not to be passive and not to be relevant, but to be pioneers. You've called us to, to take ground and And so, Lord, I I pray that today you're doing a work in our lives. We're going to take some ground today as men. Holy Spirit, do the work that only you can do. Would you just remove the pressure and weight off of men right now? As we submit ourselves to your design, we step into, we put on your armor. It is not heavy, it is light, it is easy. We are ready not just walk with you, but to fight with you. Lord, I pray for every battle that every man is facing right now. Would you bring those things down? Just as we worship today, all the curses that the enemy would try and put on us, let us break them with worship and honoring you. Let us cast aside any idol that would try and raise itself up against you and your holy name and your design for our life. And let us go to war with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Oh, how good it is to be a man in today. We were made for such a time as this. We bless you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Thank you guys so much.